Thank you. Welcome. Uh, it looks like we have a packed house for the most part, which is great. We were very nervous about whether this would all work out or whether there were some sardines that would be on the outside of the can, but hopefully it looks like everyone for the most part got in, which is very, very exciting. Um, in addition, because we had to cancel, as most of you know, the February event due to weather and you know, we have two straight weeks of 80 degree weather with sun out and I look at the forecast and I'm thinking, is this possible that she flew in yesterday that she wouldn't be able to get in? But thankfully it wasn't like it was in February where planes were grounded in Michigan, which was the primary problem. But anyway, we're thrilled uh, to have Kristen Dumay here. Um, I'll introduce her in a bit, um, but I want to say a couple things first just about the, the center that I run. Um, my name is Jeff Scholes. I uh, am a professor in the philosophy department here at UCCS, and I also run the Center for Religious Diversity and Public Life here uh, through the philosophy department. Um, what we do is primarily bring in scholars religion scholars, philosophy scholars, historians, uh, anyone that's talking about religion and its relationship to public life. And there's a lot to talk about as our speaker today, uh, if you don't already know, will uh, inform us of. Um, but we're thrilled to have her. Um, so if you, I think what I've done is anyone who registered for the event, it's not on my primary community, community email list, you're now on it. So if you've registered, <laughs> tell me to take you off the list if you don't want to be on it. That's completely fine. But we bring in scholars every semester, and um, this is a very big one, but uh, we bring in ones that hopefully um, won't be too kind of chaotic getting in in the future. But then again, we may go big too again, but um, we've certainly gone big this time. Um, so we're beyond excited to have Dr. Dumay here uh, to give her talk, Jesus and John Wayne, Evangelical Masculinity, Family Values, Politics and the Rise of Christian Nationalism. Before we get into introductions and sponsors and that stuff, I do want to acknowledge that the land in which this event is taking place is unceded land of the Ute peoples. Um, so I want to thank our co-sponsors first. The primary sponsor is my center, the Center for Religious Diversity and Public Life, but this would not have happened without the generosity and the willingness to promote the event by uh, several co-sponsors. Um, the Jesus Has Left the Building podcast, hosted by Marta Fiori, uh, Fioriti and, uh, and Mandy Todd, and uh, Kristen was gracious enough to join us on a podcast in February, I believe it was, right? Um, so uh, them, the uh, Holy Heretics podcast, which is hosted by UCC's own Gary Allen Taylor. Thank you, Gary Allen. Uh, Raw Tools, a nonprofit here in town, founded and run by Mike Martin, who is also here. Um, I should say Raw Tools is mostly known for gun buybacks and the transformation of, of weapons of destruction into tools, hence the RAW, which is playing on war, reversed tools. But in addition to that, I just want to say that RAW tools and Mike and others uh, generally attempt to promote peace through nonviolence, and this is one of the ways in which they do it, the, the way they're most known. So Mike, thank you so much, and thank you for the work you do with RAW tools. Um, the Humanities uh, Program here at UCCS, generous support from the Director of the Humanities Program, Dorothea Olkowski, uh, and finally the Department of History here at UCCS, in particular Paul Harvey, who could not be here today but knows Kristen well, introduced Kristen to myself a while ago to kind of help uh, get it going, but the History Department also um, uh, gave generously. Um, I want to thank my research assistant, Mike Acevedo, who is here in the back, or maybe he's out front, but he did so much of the legwork, the little things. Um, I, I'm not sure I would have been able to pull off this by myself. It would have been difficult. So Mike, thank you so much. And finally, the philosophy department here at UCCS uh, for its continued support for the center that I run and its activities. And thank you to you all. Um, obviously, we've gone through a difficult two and a half years with Zoom events and whatnot. And I think the showing here today is hopefully proof positive that we're out of the weeds there, yet we're in a different set of weeds that Kristen is going to talk about, which I trust is a large part of why you're here. Uh, so out of the frying pan into the fire, I suppose, to some extent. All right, so the structure of the event. Kristen is going to talk for about 45 minutes, uh, and at that point we're going to start Q&A. The event goes from a little after three. We may go a little after 4.30 just because we're starting a little bit later to get everyone in. Um, there are two microphones at the end of each aisle, um, and I will kind of moderate the Q&A, but don't, don't get off your seat and walk the mic until she's, she's finished, and don't sprint and run people over to get there. We'll try to get as many questions in in the 45 minutes that, that uh, follow that, um, but please, I will just say from the outset to try to keep it to a, a question rather than commentary, because um, there'll probably be a lot of people that want to ask questions and want to try to get uh, everyone in. Um, 
Dr. DeMay will be signing uh, her book, Jesus and John Wayne, outside. If you bought one beforehand, fantastic. If you brought your own, fantastic. You can buy it after the event, and she'll be there for a meet and greet to uh, sign your book for a bit. We have a dinner reservation later, so there is a, a limit on how long she'll be there, but she will be there for a decent amount of time, right? Okay. <laughs> um, finally, the event is being recorded. Um, it's not live stream, but it is being recorded. Uh, I'm going to put it up on the YouTube, UCCS YouTube channel, and I'll send it out to all registrants and anyone in the community email list um, as a YouTube link sometime next week when it's done. So for those that couldn't make it in here or for those that want to watch it again, uh, it'll be there permanently up on YouTube. All right. Uh, Dr. Kristen Dumay is a professor of history and gender studies at Calvin University, formerly Calvin College. I have to say that to myself and to others, but uh, changed her name maybe three or four years ago, so Calvin University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She holds a PhD from the University of Notre Dame, and her research focuses on the intersection of gender, religion, and politics. She has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, NBC News, Religion News Service, and Christianity Today and has been interviewed on NPR, CBS, and the BBC, and there's more because I think when you sent this to me, the list was incomplete. And in fact, she told me last night that she was interviewed by the New York Times, and there was an article that came out last night where she is being interviewed, uh, among other outlets. Her most recent book is Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kristen DeMay to the stage. Have my clock here to make sure because honestly it is such an incredible delight to be here in Colorado Springs with you all. <laughs> Seriously and as I, you know, I have some prepared remarks and then uh, last night and this morning and this morning I attempt to walk around the city and I just kept thinking oh I want to say that too and oh I want to add that in there too and so um, so hence the the clock I'm going to try to be disciplined here. Um, it's, it's huge thanks to Jeff and to all of the sponsors and let me tell you it, it's a lot of work to put on an event like this and then it's a whole lot of work to cancel and reschedule an event like this. And to tell you the truth, our original plan was when the, you know, the blizzard was sweeping through and it was just not happening and I rebooked and then that flight got canceled and I rebooked and that one got canceled and rebooked again and then I at one point had two different flights booked and they were all canceled and we just had to concede this is not going to happen. And um, so then, then the plan was, um, Jeff said, well, okay, well, we'll do it by Zoom, right? We'll do it. We, we know how to do this. And, I said, okay, yeah, it's a whole lot easier. And then, and then I don't know, a few hours later, I think I, I texted and said, that just doesn't feel right, not for Colorado Springs. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you for being here and thank you also to the co-sponsors. And uh, one thing I will say, is, you know, and this might come up in Q&A, but people think that I, I get a lot of hate mail and stuff. Um, I actually don't, and uh, let's keep it that way, that's good. Um, but uh, honestly, it's, it's the reverse. Since the book came out almost three years ago now, I have received so many messages, so many uh, letters, and connections from people across the country and, and frankly around the world. People who are in the book, um, people whose life stories kind of inhabit this book, and just so much affirmation. And one of the, the challenges I was just talking with a, a friend this morning is like, how do we find each other? How do we, how do we find each other in real life? Social media is great, uh, but there are many of us kind of uh, walking similar paths. And so being in person, and being connected to other organizations and to other individuals is just an incredible privilege that I have, that I know many people are out there and feel isolated who, who don't have that. And so I urge you to like find people at this event, stay after, um, you know, connect to the sponsors and, and find that real life community to, um, to, 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 to be a source of support and inspiration. Okay, I'm not doing a good job of staying on time because my introductory comments are supposed to be like 10 seconds. So, um, okay, let me start then with um, a history of the book, where, how the book started. 
And I had to go back about 15 years ago, maybe more than, more than 15 years ago now, because time just keeps passing. Uh, I was a new professor at then Calvin College uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I was teaching a course in US history, survey course. Overwhelmed, uh, just new, um, very young prof, and I wanted to introduce my students in this survey course to the concept of gender in history. How does gender work in history? Uh, because as a historian, I know that gender changes dramatically over time. Ideas of masculinity and femininity, they change over time. And that they're linked to, yes, religious beliefs, but not just religion. They're, it's linked to economic shifts, linked to race, linked to social class, even linked to foreign policy. And there's no better example of this in U.S. history, at least as far as I'm concerned, than Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt. So I gave this lecture in my U.S. history course on Teddy Roosevelt and how he embodied a new form of masculinity in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, and, and it was this rough and rugged and um, very white and imperialistic conception of masculinity, you know, and war, and a um, whole bunch to say on Teddy Roosevelt. So I gave this lecture, I thought it went over fairly well, and after class, a couple of guys from the class came up to me, were waiting to talk to me as I was wrapping up my notes, and then they said, Professor Dumay, there is a book that you have got to read. And that book was John Eldridge's Wild at Heart. <laughs> How many of you have read John Eldridge's Wild at Heart? Of course you have. Now, for those of you who haven't, uh, I, this was, so I was teaching this class, it was around 2005 or 2006, a long time ago. That book came out in 2001. So by that time, it was a huge deal. Everybody I knew was reading the book or trying to avoid reading the book. <laughs> That was me. Um, my church was hosting multiple groups. Men's groups were reading it, and then the women's were reading Captivating, and then all the guys in the dorm were having these book studies over and over again. Wild at Heart was everywhere. And up until that point, I was one who was trying to ignore it. You know, not, not my thing, pretty sure. But I took their advice. So I drove down to Family Christian Bookstore. <laughs> I'm dating myself. Back, back in the day, we had bookstores. Um, and and uh, I still have that copy uh, with the price, uh, little price sticker of 1995. <laughs> I paid 1995 for this book. I opened it up and I saw exactly what they were talking about, this, my students. Because the book opens with a quote from Teddy Roosevelt and goes on to sketch this vision of masculinity, of Christian manhood, based not very much on the scriptures. In fact, Bible verses are few and far between, and most are taken completely out of context in that book, right? But sketching a vision of Christian manhood that is inspired by mythical warriors, by Hollywood heroes, by cowboys, by soldiers, and by people like Teddy Roosevelt, right? And then from those sources of inspiration, builds this conception of Christian manhood that is at its heart militant, militaristic. God is a warrior God, and men are made in his image, right? Every man has a battle to fight and a beauty to rescue, right? Again, I read this and I thought, really? <laughs> And, but again, I knew how it was it just so popular, but it struck me immediately for being a view of Christian masculinity, not a lot of the scriptures in there. But I also knew what else was going on at that time. So again, this is around 2005, 2006, the early years of the Iraq War. And all this survey data was coming out that kept showing how white evangelicals were outliers. Far and ahead, more likely than any other demographic, to support the Iraq War, to support uh, 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 preemptive war in general, to embrace aggressive foreign policy to condone the use of torture. Every single survey, white evangelicals, top of the charts. And so I asked the question that I had been trained to ask as a historian of gender, and as somebody who's read a lot of books on Teddy Roosevelt. What might one of these things have to do with the other? 
right? So I started researching this book. I spent a year and a half on it. Uh, and I immersed myself in the literature, popular literature of um, evangelical publishers on, on Christian manhood. And what I discovered is that Wild at Heart was the tip of the iceberg, right? So many books written that were essentially plagiarized, like directly plagiarized, the same cast of characters. You've got uh, General MacArthur and Teddy Roosevelt, and you've got, oh my goodness, everywhere, Mel Gibson's William Wallace from the movie Braveheart. <laughs> right, you know it. Uh, over and over again, the same cast of characters. And I started to notice John Wayne popping up over and over again. I thought, really? Really, John Wayne? And, um, and so these books, just the tip of the iceberg. And so I, I thought, I need to do something with this. I spent a year and a half researching, and then I set the project aside for a few different reasons. Uh, one, I had to finish my first book, and um, I thought for a, a brief moment I could write two books at the same time. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. And then I had a baby, and then I had another baby, and um, so there was a practical element. But there was also uh, something that troubled me about the topic itself. And because what I was reading, and this was also the heyday of Mark Driscoll, and so I was tracking Driscoll and, and his militarism and misogyny, and, and what I was reading and what I was hearing seemed extreme. It seemed extremist. And, and so I was torn. I'm a Christian. You may have heard otherwise, but I am. <laughs> And I, I work at an institution where we take our Christian scholarship very seriously. And, and so I, I, I had this, this question of, is this what I ought to be doing as a Christian scholar? Because what, it, what it, I felt like it was doing is shining a bright light on what may well be the darkest underbelly of American Christianity. And, and so I, I wasn't quite sure. And is this, does it warrant it? Is this mainstream or is this fringe? Because it sure felt fringe when I was reading this stuff. On the other hand, I was looking at these book sales, and it was everywhere, and I just didn't quite know how to tease that out. So all of those reasons combined, I set it aside. But I didn't stop paying attention. For the next decade, I kept tracking these guys, just kept tabs on them. And what I saw, and, and let me say too, that decision as a Christian to you know, um, kind of set this aside, at the time, it felt like a noble thing. And I've, I've since come to think differently about that. But I kept track of these guys. Didn't know, didn't really think I was going to do anything. I don't know why. I just, you know, kept tabs. And what I saw in the next decade is one after another of the guys that I had been following, that I had been reading, that I had been tracking, became implicated in scandal, in abuse of power, or in sexual abuse. And either directly as perpetrators or indirectly supporting their friends who were perpetrators. And so I just took notes. Fast forward to the fall of 2016. Not November, October. Remember what happened in October 2016? Access Hollywood tapes released. I remember that vividly because the next day, the next morning, I had my first live television <laughs> interview scheduled. I was supposed to be talking about the, uh, that night's debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and Access Hollywood story breaks. I'm like, what am I going to be asked to talk about on national television? Turns out they asked me about a linguistic study that I did in the software that I used. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere I've got to like find that video. You could just see me like, are you, are you serious? All right, let me tell you about Aunt Conk. Um, <laughs> so, so anyway, I remember that vividly, and you all do too, right? And the, 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 the nation kind of stopped. What are white evangelicals going to do? Because by then it was very clear that white evangelicals were key to any chance that Donald Trump had of winning the presidency. We watched, right? And we watched just a couple ever so briefly waver. Like Wayne Grudem rescinded his, his endorsement. Then he prayed about it. And by the end of the week, he was back. Most were steadier. It made no difference. And so everybody was asking, how 
Can white evangelicals betray their values to vote for a man like Donald Trump? And that question really came to the fore the next month when we saw that that's exactly what they did. Except I knew from the history that I had already researched that that was not the right way to frame the question. Because I knew we had seen this before. We had seen this over and over again in the case of abuse, in the case of abuse of power, in the case of sexual abuse. And I had been tracking these stories, and these stories were out in the open for anybody who cared to listen because the women were telling their stories. They were all out there. Now, this is me, uh, pre Me Too. All right, this is pre Me Too. So when I decided to write the book that became Jesus and John Wayne, one of the very first things that I did was consult a lawyer because I knew that the last chapter of the book needed to be there, the chapter on this abuse. And I knew that we were looking at different sides of the same corrupt system. And uh, so fast forward then, we see the election, that's the question of the hour, and so I wrote a little piece on evangelical masculinity and militarism. And I published it on this online journal, Religion and um, Politics, and it went viral. It was time 12, time to the inauguration. It went viral, and I know you're not supposed to read the comments online, <laughs> but I did, and what I saw convinced me to write the book. I saw so many evangelical men who found their way to that article and said, this is true. So I decided to write the book. Okay, then, as a historian, one of the biggest challenges that, that you have when you're writing a history book is where do you start? Where do you start? Because you can start, I mean, go, you can just keep going back. And I knew things really pick up in the 1970s, right? Rise of the religious right. But I knew I needed to at least include the 1940s with the formation of National Association of Evangelicals, and I needed to get the Cold War in there. But then I actually thought, no, I need the fundamentalist modernist conflict because people don't know history anymore. And then I thought, no, I actually have to go back to the 19th century. <laughs> And so that's all of that first chapter. Uh, it took a lot of rewrites to get it past my editor. Um, a lot had to go in there. The reason I wanted to go back to the 19th century ever so briefly is because I needed to show that things have not always been as they are now. That is so important because when you are located in a historical moment, as we all are, uh, it can be hard to imagine alternatives. And we just take for granted this is the way things are. This is the way masculinity is. This is the way Christianity is. If we go back to the 19th century, we can see that ideals of Christian manhood were not rough and tough and rugged. Uh, the idea of the, this, uh, in Victorian Christianity, of this gentlemanly restraint was what it meant to be a Christian. But you have something a little different in the American South, one that is more about order and domination domination of women, children, and non-white peoples, enslaved peoples, right? And so you have that. You've got competing masculinities. There, there are always multiple masculinities. And then in the early 20th century, you have the Teddy Roosevelt model that comes to the fore and it brings together this like Southern culture of honor with his changing ideals of masculinity, a rejection of the gentlemanly restraint and an embrace of this rugged, rough, tough, and predominantly white masculinity, right? And so I just needed to tell that story. Things have not always been as they are now. And in the early 20th century, the church responds to this more rugged image of masculinity. And you have the men and religion forward movement trying to take back the church for men. From whom? You know. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is there too, yes, conservatives were involved, but actually the liberals were leading that charge. The liberal Protestants were. And then, and then you have World War I, where it's like, OK, man up here, right? And you have this connection of this rugged masculinity and militarism. And yes, you have Billy Sunday literally leaping atop his pulpit and waving an American flag and rallying Christians to war. But actually, you had more of that on the left than on the right, if we can even use those categories. Liberal Protestants were gung-ho. Liberal Protestants were Christian nationalists back in the day. And a lot of conservative Protestants were not. They rejected Christian nationalism because what does it mean to be a Christian? It means for God to save you, your soul. And nation doesn't have a soul, so what are you even talking about? Plus, look around you. Does it look like a Christian nation? 
right? Things have not always been as they are now. And so I had to say a lot very quickly in the early part of the book to pick things up in the 1940s, really, where you had fundamentalists who had been marginalized or at least were not able to retain control of major denominations. They didn't disappear like the liberals thought they did and like the coastal elites assumed they did. They just started their own Bible colleges and their networks, but they were they are not so much networks, Bible colleges and independent churches. They were not well networked. And so in 1942, they come together and they say, look, we are all doing really good things for God but we need to come together, we need to band together, because imagine what we could do if we pooled our resources. Uh, and also we need to rebrand. Fundamentalist is a little bit harsh, a little bit dated. Um, let's call ourselves evangelicals. And they do, and they form the National Association of Evangelicals. And if you go back to some of their founding speeches and documents, you see they had a plan. And they said, we are going to join up our Bible colleges into uh, organizations and networks, and we are going to have Christian publishing and Christian bookstores in country, in cities and small towns across this country, and we're going to take to the airwaves, radio, right, and we are going to have magazines with subscribers in the tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands. Reading that as a historian was remarkable because within 15 years they accomplished all of that and more. And the man at the center of that effort was Billy Graham. Billy Graham, in the 1940s, that's when he really comes to prominence as an evangelist during the Second World War. And you want to see some Christian nationalism? Listen to some of those sermons. Uh, Second World War, pretty easy to be the good guys, right? When you're fighting Hitler, it works pretty well. Um, like, thoroughly Christian nationalist agenda as part of his evangelism, as part of his soul-saving uh, 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 crusades. Uh, and then World War II comes to an end and immediately we find ourselves in the Cold War. And that works just as well. In the Cold War, we have an enemy, the communists. Communists, anti-God, anti-family, anti-American. All the things that evangelicals held dear. Evangelicals weren't alone in these values though, right? This was also consensus America. This is, uh, right, leave it to beaver era, right? So family values, all the rage, and communists were bad, we can all agree on that, right? And so this is the moment when evangelicals had come up with this plan, right, to band together and to assert their influence across the country. It was the perfect time to do that. And in just a few short years, they moved from the margins, undeniably the margins, in and out, so that they're in and out of the Eisenhower White House, right? Billy Graham. Remarkable shift of fortune. Everything was going great until the 1960s. <laughs> what happens in the 1960s? And first you have the Civil Rights Movement, incredibly disruptive to the status quo in the American South. Oh, and by the way, the majority of white Southerners, white evangelicals, we often forget that. We kind of have our different fields, different books that we read. We're talking about the same people here. Um, have the feminist movement disrupting traditional ideals of gender, or quote unquote traditional gender roles. And you have the Vietnam War and the anti war movement challenging ideas of American greatness and goodness. All of these things incredibly disruptive. And what evangelicals find themselves in a position no longer at the centers of power, no longer. They had just moved into this mainstream and were enjoying that position of power very much. Mm -hmm. And now other Americans were saying, maybe not, maybe not. Maybe America isn't good. Maybe America isn't great. Right? And that's when evangelicals double down on these values. But now they are not consensus values, they are oppositional values. Oppositional, and the enemies are their fellow Americans. Right? And, but they understand themselves as a faithful remnant. They hold the truth, and that they have a God-given charge to restore American goodness, American greatness, to restore Christian America. Now, you may have heard a thing or two about Christian nationalism of late. 
a little bit bewildering as a historian to have it all the rage uh, <laughs> because I, this is nothing new. And every time I give an interview to a journalist about Christian nationalism, that's usually the first words out of my mouth. Okay, okay, yeah, this is nothing new, right? Um, but I mean, you could go back, the idea that America was founded as a Christian nation, right? I mean, how do we define Christian nationalism? You could pull out sociological definitions, right? It depends which survey you're looking at. I actually defined it in the book in very kind of layperson's terms. Christian nationalism, the idea that America was founded as a Christian nation and ought to be defended as such. Now, what that entails, a wide range, right? And that's where we can get into some of the details. But in fact, you know, you could say uh, Christian nationalists, like I said, liberal Protestants in the early 20th century would count as Christian nationalists. Black Protestants would count as Christian nationalists. In fact, when you look at some of these surveys today, you'll see what may be a surprising number of black Christians who would qualify, according to certain definitions, as Christian nationalists. However, what they mean by that is dramatically different than what white evangelicals traditionally have meant by that, and certainly since the 1960s, 1970s, right? So as a historian, I'm not looking at rubrics as much as I'm looking at this historical movement and looking at what is meant by this, right? So I'll come back to that in, um, in a little bit. So, uh, what I did find is when I was looking at um, this Christian nationalism in the Cold War era, um, that it was intimately linked with ideals of gender. So much so that when I was reading uh, evangelical sex guides from the 1960s and 1970s, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So quick story, even though I don't even have time for it. Um, <laughs> so when I, when I put together the proposal for this book and sent it to multiple publishers, um, I, they asked, uh, asked for a sample chapter, right? And I had one chapter written at that time, and so I sent it off, and um, it was my chapter three, I think what's currently chapter three, I don't even remember. So, um, and on, um, it was about sex and uh, like uh, Tim and Betty uh, uh, LaHaye's uh, sex book. And it was just one of many things. But it turns out, like, there was one Christian publisher that was actually bidding on the book. And so um, I found out later that they actually had to make hard copies and send it around because it was triggering their anti-porn. Uh, <laughs> 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 this is not my fault, guys, right? Um, so anyway, I digress. Um, I, <laughs> So, but when I would read these, it was startling. Like, what does it mean to be a Christian woman, right? Well, it means being feminine. It means being submissive. It means so that you can, you can prop up the ego of your husband, who is made to be aggressive, made to be dominant, but you need to submit to him so that he can be dominant. Why? So that he can take his place as leader of family, yes, of church, yes, but also of this nation. Right. So books on how to be a Christian wife are wrapping up with lessons about the Cold War and the military. Right. So, so I'm not making this stuff up. It's right there in the sources if you, if you are looking for it, even if you're not looking for it. It's there. <laughs> and so uh, this is the story that I tell in Jesus and John Wayne. And this is where it gets into more familiar, ter familiar territory with the 60s and into the 70s and the rise of the Christian right culminating in 1980 in the election of Ronald Reagan. Uh, what does John Wayne have to do with any of this? I did not set out to write a book about John Wayne at all. Uh, but like I said, I noticed in some of these books, um, popular evangelical books, uh, the, that they were turning not to the scriptures, not to theology, but to popular secular heroes. If I could have found a way to squeeze uh, Jesus and Mel Gibson's William Wallace from the movie Braveheart into the chapter. I might have, or into the title, I might have gone with that. Um, I, I just couldn't. Um, John Wayne worked, but John Wayne also works because it roots this historically. It roots this historically because this is where this essential moment, John Wayne during the 60s and 70s comes to stand as this icon of conservative American white masculinity over against those hippies and the counterculture. And he is very explicit about that. If you read the book, you will see. Right? He's racist and he's um, uh, you know, 
against liberals, against, against the hippies, and he embodies this, but he also embodies what many see as a lost virtue of masculinity, of this rugged masculinity, the good guy with the gun, the white man who will bring order through violence if necessary, right? And so that, that he becomes this secular icon first, and then evangelicals embrace that vision of masculinity, and that's really one of the themes that I tease out through the book is what is secular and what is religious. And evangelicals love to draw a very sharp line in whatever they are saying or doing or selling is religious versus the evil secular world, but that is not how this history works. Okay, so then in the book, we got to the 80s, Ronald Reagan, this more familiar territory. For me, the, the chapter on the 1990s was actually one of my favorite ones to write because things get messy there, because the Cold War is over. And it seems like everything is up for grabs because the Cold War had been such a crucible for ideas of foreign policy, yes, for domestic politics and for gender for so long. What happens now? And if you go back and if you read all these books, there are a lot of books written about manhood in the 1990s, uh, evangelical masculinity, right? This is the time of the evangelical men's movement, promise keepers. And one word that kept bubbling up over and over again was confusion. Confusion. What does it mean to be a man? What should our politics be? And honestly, as a historian, when you're reading these kind of in real time, or not in real time, actually, but if you imagine yourself back, it really felt like things were moving in a different direction. Because even though the feminists thought Promise Keepers was horrifying, and it's just the religious right in disguise, which it kind of was, there's truth to that, but not, that wasn't all it was. There were also egalitarian visions within Promise Keepers. Uh, they upheld patriarchy, but it was a soft patriarchy. They wanted masculine leadership, but it was servant leadership. Right? All this resonating with you all. Okay, I gotta ask, how many of you went to Promise Keepers rallies? <laughs> okay, we've got, we've got a few. Um, Right, so you know, like it was, it was a mixed bag there. A kind of kinder, gentler, updated patriarchy. <laughs> that wasn't even supposed to be funny. <laughs> but then, over the course of the decade, you start to see things, the pendulum starts to swing back, and you see more discontent. And William Wallace seems like a better model than the softer, gentler patriarchy. And, um, and, and so you start to see a backlash already by the end of the 1990s. And by 2001, we see the effects of that, the fruits of that, in three books that are, are published that year. John Eldridge's Wild at Heart, James Dobson's Bringing Up Boys, Testosterone is Key to, to uh, Masculinity, to Boyhood, uh, right? God's gift to men and to women uh, by virtue of men uh, and their protectors. And so, yeah, you want your little boys to play with guns? Absolutely. And, and Doug Wilson's uh, uh, Future Men, where he, he presents the theology of fist fighting, among other things. And <laughs> all three of these books, published in 2001, were on the shelves of Christian bookstores when terror struck the United States on September 11. Every man has a battle to fight. That battle is no longer metaphorical. And now we are up to the point where I started, right, in the early 2000s, where I'm reading all these, this, this, because um, Eldridge's book sold more than 4 million copies. The way this works in all publishing, not just Christian publishing, is everybody wants a piece of that market. And so all of these copycat books, essentially plagiarized books, same cast of characters, except many of them taking things much, to much more extreme places than Eldridge himself did. Right? And you can see how explicitly this vision of aggressive warrior masculinity gets linked to foreign policy and increasingly to domestic politics. It's all there. And this is where uh, Colorado Springs takes center stage. <laughs> Yeah, so you can see, you know, focus on the family is, is um, kind of threaded through this book. And honestly, you know, many histories of evangelicalism had been written before Jesus and John Wayne, but it just baffled me that many of them were written without one single mention of James Dobson in it. Because they're looking at the theologians, at the leaders, at the seminaries, the kind of respectable, and ignoring this popular culture. But to me, that is what evangelicalism largely is. 
And, 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 and Dobbs in this perfect example of, of building a popular audience and then turning that political, right? Deeply political, but so powerful precisely because it doesn't appear to be political, at least not initially, right? So Dobson's in there, and we've got the um, a New Life Church, Ted Haggard, uh, if you remember back to that, and <laughs> The, the, the you know, Fort Victory and these statues and, and, and I make the claim in the book that this, um, and, and then you have like both of those working um, with the Air Force Academy and the US military and you see this is the era where military chaplains start to be seen and not just chaplains, just any, anybody who serves in the military as the leading expert on Christian masculinity, on Christianity itself even, right? This is the moment, the early 2000s. Now, I suggest that when we look at Colorado Springs, we can see how this militant masculinity is entrenched within American evangelicalism. And you can see how then it shapes the political vision and political tactics, right? Evangelicalism is more than this, but evangelicalism is not less than this. Okay, so let me see here. I've got to check my time, see how we're doing. Oh, we're, we're fine. We're good. <laughs> okay, so now we're into the 2000s, and um, I, suppose, I suppose we're up to uh, 2008, uh, the election of Barack Obama, Barack Hussein Obama. Oh, because we also have to talk about those ex-Muslim terrorists, right? If you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the, the other thing is, um, so... Uh, in the years after 9-11, uh, a, a number of former Muslim terrorists really took the evangelical speaking circuit by storm. And uh, I know about, or knew about this back in the day because one of them came to Calvin, uh, um, Kamal Salim. You may have heard of him. He's the, the Forrest Gump guy of, of uh, ex-Muslim terrorists. He was everywhere um, <laughs> as a terrorist. And all these guys have similar stories. How, uh, how they're Muslim terrorists, and then they, they became converted to Christianity, to evangelical Christianity, Southern Baptist, or missionary, through God's word, God, God speaking to them. And then they became proselytizers, and they spoke on stages like this across American Christianity. They were all the rage. Like, they were booked out years in advance. So this guy came to Calvin, started telling his story, and my colleague, Doug Howard, a professor of the Ottoman Empire, who knows a thing or two about Islam, within minutes, was like, this makes no sense. That, that word doesn't actually exist. This guy is a fraud. And so he, um, through connections, uh, got then uh, connected to one of the uh, sponsors of this individual uh, who was, uh, oh, he was sponsored by Focus on the Family. And so he got Jim Daly on the phone. Turns out he knew he was a fraud. <coughs> And it wasn't just that. None of these guys had been terrorists, right? None at all. And one had grown up in Ohio with a Swedish Lutheran mom. Um, <laughs> but this story sold. This is what evangelicals wanted to hear. Why? And, and it was in, in, in grappling with this question that something clicked for me. Because all of that kind of punditry around understanding the evangelical vote in 2016, a, a, a frequent theme was fear. Evangelicals are just so afraid, right? Their religious liberty is eroding. The demographics, all right, the end of white Christian America is not looking good, right? Uh, evangelicals are just so afraid. What choice did they have but to run into the arms of somebody like Donald Trump? But what I saw with these ex-Muslim terrorists is that the fear was real among members of the audience, certainly after they heard these harrowing tales and heard that Christians were targeted and evangelicals in particular because they were the most faithful Christians. But it was all fake. It was all fake. So what I understood was the fear is, was real as it was felt, but it was manufactured. It was manufactured. It was made up. Why? Because for leaders who have embraced this militant model of Christianity, 
Stoking fear in the hearts of their followers is how they consolidate their own power. You can demand loyalty if you are at war. Any dissent is treason. And stoking fear, right, driving up this urgency, is a really, really good way to raise money. That is what we're looking at. And once, I, once that clicked for me, and then I look back at Jerry Falwell Sr. and his Thomas Road Baptist Church, and I looked at Mark Driscoll and, when he, and, and his Mars Hill Church, full of this militant, militaristic imagery, just absolutely running through everything he did. And when he would preach, he would be visibly flanked by security guards, right? To ratchet up this sense of danger so that he could demand absolute loyalty from his followers and absolute sacrifice, right? That's how this worked. Okay, so then we have Barack Hussein Obama elected president, and you have the sea change on uh, LGBTQ, on same-sex marriage with the Obergefell decision. You have, again, these demographic changes. And also in 2008, we had a small number of younger white evangelical defectors who ended up voting for Obama. And the leaders of the old guard noticed, and they did not like that, and they did not take that lightly. And so they worked, James Dobson leading the charge to undermine Barack Obama at every turn, right? And, um, and so there's this anxiety building up and anxiety being actively stoked, this victimization narrative. So that brings us to 2016. And that brings us to Donald Trump, the man who appears seemingly out of nowhere and promises that he will fight for evangelicals in particular, that he will protect Christianity. And evangelicals heard that and that is what they wanted not initially from the top down, right? remember that? Um, but I push back against theories that there was a kind of reluctant embrace because if you go back, you see the first signs of evangelical grassroots support for Donald Trump welling up as early as August of 2015. 2015, right? And the media reported on this and evangelical leaders poo-pooed it. Russell Moore called it the reality TV phase of the campaign, and he said he did not know a single pastor who supported Trump. And we know what happened to Russell Moore, right? So it started at the grassroots, and then over time, by January 2016, you have leaders like uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. and Robert Jeffress getting on board, and the momentum just continues to grow, and evangelicals embrace of Donald Trump grows as they get to know him and who he is. And if you remember that Republican primary that season, it was ugly. It was rough. And um, nobody could hold a candle to the toughness, the crassness of Donald Trump on, those, on that stage. And some of them tried. Remember Rubio, Cruz, it didn't go well. Nobody could, um, right? Nobody, no, nobody could out Trump Trump. And um, evangelicals saw that and said he was their ultimate fighting champion. He was the man who would do what needed to be done. He would bring back their words of John Wayne, America, right? He was the warrior who would lead the charge. And that's what I saw and that's what I knew. And it was not a conundrum. Evangelicals hadn't embraced Donald Trump despite their values. In many ways, we could see that as the fulfillment of their values if you understand what those values actually were. And if you go back historically, you can see that at the center of family values politics, historically, politically speaking, you have to locate the assertion of white patriarchal authority, civil rights, feminism, anti-war, what will solve all of those? The assertion of white patriarchal authority. So that brings us up to uh, 2016. Actually, I'll just jump to 2020 when I published the book that makes that case. Um, and let me just talk very briefly here about the um, few takeaways, my own takeaways first um, from this book. Uh, one, one of the main interventions that this does, if there's any um, people interested in scholarly uh, conversations, historiography in particular, 
one of the key interventions I make is in how I define evangelicalism, and I already alluded to this just a little bit. Um, evangelicals themselves, folks in the National Association of Evangelicals, for example, if you go to their website, they love this definition. They define themselves theologically, right? And they, uh, so to be an evangelical is to uphold the authority of the scriptures, uh, crucicentrism or the centrality of the cross of Christ, conversionism, this born again experience, and then activism or um, evangelism, you're acting out of these faith commitments, right? Every historian of evangelicalism pretty much just uses that definition, and that is fully what I intended to do when I set out to write this book. How do you define evangelical? Well, this historian of British evangelicalism, David Bebbington, has given us that nice little four-part rubric known as the Bebbington Quadrilateral by History Nerds, and I fully intended to just drop that right in my intro and then write the book I was going to write. And then at a certain point, I realized this, this is not helpful. This is not actually describing what I'm seeing in my research. One, race is utterly invisible in this rubric. Because if you take those four points, the vast majority of black Protestants check off every single one of those boxes. And the vast majority of black Protestants who check off all those boxes do not consider themselves evangelicals. Why? Because it is clear to them that there is so much more to being evangelical than checking off those boxes. Plus, I was looking at surveys that evangelicals were doing of themselves that showed alarming to them rates of theological illiteracy. Evangelicals largely don't know a thing about theology. <laughs> Evangelical pastors in the room, you can confirm, right? So why are we defining evangelicals according to a theological rubric when that is not really what motivates them, right? And, and so I am, I'm a cultural historian. I am not dealing with a static, ahistorical rubric. I am defining a historical, cultural, religious movement. And so I look at evangelicalism. I don't actually define it. I describe it. And it's a series of networks and alliances. So we can talk parachurch organizations. There's no better place to talk parachurch organizations than right here. <laughs> and publishers, and let's talk Christian radio, and Caleb, and Salem, and Christian bookstores back when we had them, right? To be an evangelical is really how immersed are you in this evangelical popular culture? In many ways, we can think of evangelicalism as a consumer culture, right? To what extent have you participated in that consumer culture. Maybe you attend an evangelical church and you're going to pick a lot of it up there. You don't have to attend an evangelical church to be immersed in this culture. And that's why this culture and this ideology spreads. It spreads across denominational borders. I spend a lot of time talking with denominational leaders in, uh, in other denominations who are at a loss because evangelicalism, cult, uh, conservative white evangelicalism has swamped their own traditions. It happens in my own denomination, the Christian Reformed Church, absolutely as well. And it also crosses national borders. And so Jesus and John Wayne has been translated into, uh, into Portuguese for the Brazilian market, uh, into Spanish for Spanish and Latin American. And I will just be announcing next week that it will also be translated soon into uh, Swahili and Luganda for the East African um, audience, and I hear from evangelicals or from Christians around the globe. Um, okay, uh, I already talked about this uh, question of fear and militancy, right? And that was just this key moment of understanding how that worked. The question that I had early on of what is mainstream, what is fringe, right? Remember that? And um, uh, that is something I tease out throughout the book. And if you've read the book, you see how I'm doing that. You've got somebody who's undeniably fringe. Bill Gothard. But then let's take somebody who's undeniably mainstream, James Dobson, and let's hold their ideas and their teachings about patriarchy and hierarchy and authority, and they overlap pretty tightly. Let's talk about Doug Wilson. Nobody would say that Doug Wilson is mainstream or would have said in the 1990s he's mainstream, least of all Doug Wilson. Right? He gets platformed by Christianity Today, by John Piper, by others. And now, where is the mainstream of American evangelicalism? Is it Doug Wilson and his Christian nationalism and his, his extreme patriarchy? Or is it Christianity today? Open question, right? Teasing that out. And uh, it also, I also came to see just how central the question of authority was. 
question of authority and showing deference to those in power ran through. You can see that in terms of gender, in terms of race, but across the board. So these are, those are my key takeaways. And you, if you've read the book, you see those are really the animating themes of the book. Now, I'll wrap things up to turn back to Christian nationalism. All of this that I've been talking about, and really the whole story of Jesus and John Wayne, only makes sense in, within a Christian nationalist framework. We have recent survey data that 64% of white evangelicals are either adherents or sympathizers. Now, you can quibble with those numbers. You can look at the categories, and I'm, I welcome that. But again, this is nothing new. But what I will say is the substance of that Christian nationalism, what kind of Christian nation do they want to build? And that is where we see it is a patriarchal one. Christian nationalists are far more than other Americans to believe that America is too soft and feminine, to uphold patriarchy, and to believe that men are punished these days just for acting like men. You see other correlations too, anti-immigration uh, in terms of race and racism and denying the existence of racism, denying the existence or being, having high levels of comfort with voter suppression, and high levels of comfort with political violence and authoritarianism. This is what we are looking at today. When people are talking about white Christian nationalism, they are talking about this manifestation of what it means to be a Christian nation. And we have ample survey data making those connections very tightly. Um, so now we are at the, uh, the point where uh, Christian nationalist adherents are seven times as likely as those who reject it to support political violence. I'm going to close now. I've gone a couple minutes over, um, and I really want to get to your uh, questions. But I'm going to close with a quote uh, from the book. And uh, this is from somebody who worked uh, with Multnomah P uh, Press for all of the years that I kind of cover. So back when Multnomah, uh, he, he had a hand in publishing Dobson and, and Stu Weber and Piper and Holton and Evans and all these guys that I'm writing about, right? And he was reluctant to give me an interview, and then he was reluctant to let me have it on the record. And we went back and forth, and I just said, I really, I think these words are so important. And I'm so grateful that, that he, he gave me his words. Um, and I honestly don't know if he regrets it now. Um, <laughs> I don't. But I, I want to share this with you in, in close. Um, over time, he explained how he felt growing discomfort with Christian nationalism that led him to distance himself increasingly from this movement that he had a hand in helping to foster. What, what did it for him? What changed his mind gradually? The study of history. Study of the history of the West in particular. Study of the history of Native Americans. We started with our land acknowledgment. Study of the history of American imperial conquest. And once he learned that history, he could no longer uphold the idea that America was somehow God's special anointed nation. When he knew actual history, and this was years before woke was a thing, right? And years before CRT was this, this big rallying cry. This is, I say this all the time, basic U.S. history. No bells and whistles, no theory needed. Walk into your local public library and ask to look at the archives, right? Basic US history. He could no longer sustain this idea of America as a Christian nation. If you believe that America is God's chosen nation, you need to fight for it and against others. That's the logical takeaway, he realized. But once you abandon that notion, he said, all other values start to shift as well. Without Christian nationalism, evangelical militarism makes no sense. Jesus, he says, makes it clear in John 13, people will know you are my disciples if you love me. But, he said, too many evangelicals have forgotten where our true citizenship is. Thank you.
Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, why don't, just in the interest of time, if you have a question for Dr. Dumay, please start coming up the aisle um, to ask her a question. I'm sure there's some. So come on up. And what we'll do is I will kind of moderate it. We'll just alternate my left to right. And then we'll get to a certain point where hopefully we can get to as many as possible. But um, again, in the interest of time, you can kind of reduce it down to a question, you can have a little commentary, but that'll enable more people to ask questions. So, Susan, we'll start with you. So what do we do? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm a historian. I don't know. Um, <laughs> honestly, so this is one of the main, well, uh, yeah, uh, one of the main critiques, I shouldn't say, I don't know, there's lots of critiques of, <laughs> of that evangelicals, that certain evangelicals will raise. First, let me say, I have been blown away by the enormously uh, enthusiastic reception of this book among evangelicals themselves. It is evangelicals, hands down, that made this book a bestseller, right? So, for all of you who are in the audience, thank you for that. And I, I do not take that for granted. And it, I, I just, I never, not for a single day, any speaking engagement I have in evangelical churches, I am always just so grateful. Um, it, but what I, what I tell evangelicals, uh, so, so one of the critiques is that, right, there's no, um, what are the three things we need to do here, right? Uh, this is, we expect that in their books, right? Christian publishers, right? Here's the takeaway. And I was like, it honestly caught me a little off guard because that's not the way history books are usually written. Um, and it's funny, actually, to have academic historians like some, kind of see some of the, the kind of pushback and like, what are they? What is this? What's going on, right? And, and, and here's my answer. Um, first of all, limited answer is, is that two evangelicals who want the takeaways. Uh, it totally depends on who you are, how you are positioned with respect to this. I mean, I've got advice I can give evangelical pastors. I've got advice I can give evangelicals. Um, but to be honest, if you are not evangelical and if you see this as really dangerous, your takeaway might be do everything you can within our constitutional powers to, um, to take power away from these folks. Right? That is a legitimate takeaway as well. Um, so what do we do? Who, who is the we? Who is the we? Um, what, the most important thing, I, I'm absolutely committed to shoring up our democracy right now. Um, you know, I talked about voter suppression. Um, the idea of Christian America, right? If, 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 if Christian nationalists are so convinced that they are on God's side, and this us versus them mentality runs through and through, going back to the 60s, this oppositional identity, right? And if you are so sure of that, that you are on God's side, and anybody who is against you is against God, what is more important? Are democratic norms and institutions or doing God's will? That is what this comes down to, and the answer is not reassuring if you care for democracy. And now, I, 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 at the end, talk about mainstream versus fringe or from beginning to end, right? This is a really tough to tease out because the majority of conservative evangelicals are not authoritarians. The majority of conservative evangelicals were not storming the Capitol on January 6th. But when you look at their teachings, the big question that I have is where are good-hearted, moderate evangelicals who have been steeped in these teachings for now generations, when push comes to shove, who are they going to side with? Right? And, and so I am all about getting very politically active and not to have one side decimate the other. I am all about structural. So in Michigan, one of the things that citizens did is worked against this uh, um, uh, terrible gerrymandering. Right? Gerrymandering is one of these structural things that doesn't get a lot of attention, needs to get a whole lot of attention, because that has created the polarized climate that we are now we're, we're living in. And um, so they, they did this citizens campaign petition drive and ended up bringing in redistricting. Uh, and and, and it, it, it has made an enormous difference in terms of Michigan politics. And um, I, I'm not big on, you know, normal, under normal, what's normal anymore, uh, you know, Republican, Democrat, whatever. Like right now, we really need to work against this dangerous polarization and the erosion of our democracy. Whatever you can do to that end is important. Since you have such a panoramic view of history in the world, I'm curious if you think at all about how this is possibly going to play out the next 20 or 30 years in America, and if yeah. so, I would love to hear 
what you think about that. Yeah, I have no idea because um, <laughs> because uh, one thing I will say as a historian is you just never know what's right around the corner. You know, on September 10, 2001, we had no idea what was just around the corner and how much that changed, changed our political landscape. Uh, so you just don't know what, what's, what's coming next. I, again, to, to get back to the uh, erosion of democracy theme, deeply, deeply concerning. Um, and, and here, I will say that historians who have studied authoritarianism have been deeply alarmed for more than five years. And I, um, um, I, I, not everybody knows this about me, but I, um, my outside field in graduate school was 20th century Germany with a focus on the Holocaust and the German Christian movement. And when I published that first article in Religion and Politics, um, the one that, that kind of went viral, immediately, like within a day or two, I got a letter from a scholar of, uh, of German uh, propaganda in um, Nazi Germany. And he said, are you aware of the um, uh, incredible similarities between the rhetoric that you just shared from white evangelical men and uh, Nazi Germany? And I wrote him back and said, I am absolutely aware. Yeah. Absolutely. And it is identical. Absolutely identical. And so, um, and now I, I, I couldn't say that in the book. <laughs> um, but um, it, it, that's a whole other book, right? It's a, but, um, but I do say it. Uh, and I, I say it in interviews when, when necessary. But um, one of my concerns here, and my concerns for evangelicals in particular, and those who might have some power, um, to affect some change is that issues, uh, this ignorance of, of this broader historical um, uh, narrative and the dangerous moment that we actually are in right now. Um, and how authoritarianism works, textbook examples right now in terms of right-wing evangelicalism and what they are facilitating and accommodating, honestly. Um, and and I, will, I will say, particularly right now, the anti-trans agenda yeah. is uh, we can talk theology, and we can talk uh, laws, and we can talk rights, and we can talk all of that stuff. But as a historian, and any historian who studies authoritarianism, we all know that this is absolutely a page out of the playbook of uh, right-wing authoritarianism. This is how this works. So what we really need are, frankly, we need conservative evangelicals who hold to conservative views of gender to say enough is enough. And that's what we need to resist this polarization. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I grew up in an evangelical household in the 80s, fairly working class. And one of the things that has always baffled me is how the uh, the right convince working class whites to give up on their labor unions. And I was wondering if yeah. you could sort of talk about the relationship between some of the roles that uh, these leaders played in, the, yeah. in undermining labor. Yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I, there are a lot of critiques of my book out there if you're on Twitter um, <laughs> that I think are um, um, ridiculous. Um, <laughs> But there's one critique that nobody makes. One person has made it, and it wasn't an evangelical, not surprisingly. Um, and they made it ever so gently. And as soon as I saw that reviewer um, um, raise this issue, I immediately wrote him and said, you are absolutely right. This is the main weakness of the book, as far as I'm concerned. And it is um, an insufficient attention to economics. Yeah, and, and around this issue in particular. You'll see there are a couple of little like hints at that. I know it, my editor knew it. We were all, it, we were just so on deadline. And so I, my um, uh, non-answer first is, I'm, I, I hope to more than make up for it in my next book. <laughs> um, my next book, I'll just promote it here. It's totally not done, so you can forget about it uh, <laughs> for, for a while. Uh, it's called Live, Laugh, Love. And <laughs> And it's a cultural history of white Christian womanhood, but it's looking very closely at, among other things, um, neoliberalism and uh, libertarianism and, and really rooting it in this economic shift um, and positive thinking and stuff. It's so much fun, but um, uh, it's just not coming fast enough right now. Uh, so, so to your point, yes, this is absolutely a kind of key part of this story in terms of understanding politics 
and religion and, and party politics. Um, I mean, you could go back to the hard hat um, riots and how the white working class, how race was used. And this is a long, a, I mean, there's, there's a long history of this in the US. Um, it's pretty much a constant of race being used to um, uh, deflect from uh, uh, social class right, uh, mobilization. Um, and, and so it's simply that familiar story again. Um, in a nutshell, but what was striking to me when I was reading all of these books in the 1990, from the 1990s was just how aware they were of the, how, how the white middle class was feeling squeezed, and also with deindustrialization, how a sense of loss among evangelical men, um, when they knew that their fathers and grandfathers had worked with their hands and had done like real work, and now they were part of this managerial class, and again, um, deindustrialization, and this was a, a kind of crisis for them, and it challenged their masculinity. This too, for any historians of gender, like where I started this talk, right, economic shifts, when, when the underpinnings, the economic underpinnings change, that's when suddenly you're gonna hear words of crisis of masculinity. Right, because the old models no longer fit onto the economic kind of substructure and things are shifting and so you need new ways of understanding what it is to be a man. Um, so all which is to say it's a really important question, it's underdeveloped in the book and I do hope to make up for it at least somewhat. Tristan, thank you for coming. Um, your book has obviously been very significant in uh, giving voice to what a lot of people have felt. Um, and it's also resonated with a lot of, as you say, evangelicals, a lot of ex-evangelicals, and a lot of people in the media that are interested in evangelicals. I'm curious if you see any sea change or shift of attitudes, or are things just hardening? In other words, are hearts and minds being changed at all as you interact? Uh, it seems that the New York Times is carrying a lot of evangelicals in their commentary, but I'm just curious, it's unfair to ask a historian this, but do you see any dynamics changing or the positions hardening? Mm -hmm. And I love what encouragement question. do you have for those of us who appreciate and agree with what you're saying and are trying to do something? Is it um, mm -hmm. what is encouraging to you about this whole issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I see individual change a lot. I see a lot of individual change, and I know people who have turned, changed course, uh, people who have done so at great costs, uh, at enormous risk, right? I know those stories, I know the people. Um, and I, I, I find their stories um, encouraging and also depressing because of the great cost that usually accompanies that. Because what I'm not seeing in evangelical spaces, for the most part, is much institutional change. To understand evangelicalism, um, yes, there are progressive evangelicals and there are conservative evangelicals. There's an evangelical left, very small, the moral minority. Um, and there's you know, the rest. And then there's the power dynamics. And that's something I try to make very plain in this book. How does power operate in these spaces? And I was just talking with, um, doing an interview for the next book, um, and it, it, with respect to a kind of major evangelical um, organization, I'm trying to think of what I can say and what I can't, um, the, the internal messaging was you don't have to align with right-wing politics, right, and Trump support and all that. You just can't speak against it. That, right, you know, you know, that is it, that is it. So no, not all evangelicals, right? But good luck to you if you try to say no, right? I know so many people without of a job. Um, Russell Moore, right? I mean, he landed fine. Um, <laughs> but um, look what happened to Beth Moore, right? Yeah. But now, but, but here's the next step. This is where I really want to get to. Um, of all of the prominent evangelicals who have taken courageous stands and have paid a price for it, I only know one who has acknowledged their own complicity in bringing us to where we are, and that is Beth Moore. Yeah. And until that happens, right, I don't know how we move forward, 
And so this is the, 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 the media, the, the New York Times, you're right, there's columnists in the Atlantic and the New York Times and, and you know, the, in the Washington Post and there's these columnists who are the kind of respectable evangelicals or the evangelical elites and they are getting hit hard from the right right now uh, in these spaces. But what I see, even though they are saying things that are good and saying things that are true, they are not open to also seeing how they as evangelical elites and largely as white evangelical men have been complicit in building this movement. And just because they are jumping off as the train is you know, going over the cliff, doesn't mean that they weren't shoveling coal into it all the time right, before. I don't even know if that works, I just made that up. Um, <laughs> right, and so that's what I'm not seeing. That's what I'm not seeing much of, and so um, I, I'm torn. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, for those of us who are sort of theology nerds, uh -huh. and uh, particular theology nerds who come out of evangelical training and evangelical households, can you talk about some of the specific theological movements and developments that accompany some of the cultural shifts you talk about? Specifically, from my background, I'm thinking the way that, you know, the umbrella of protection, oh, yeah. and you reference in the book a couple of times the way Baptist premillennialism um, affects some responses. Yeah. And that wasn't covered much in the book. Can mm -hmm. you say more about it? Yeah, mostly with the um, end times and stuff, I, I'd say go read Matt Sutton's book. Um, uh, right, American Apocalypse, and Daniel Hummel has a brand new book out on that as well. Uh, but you're right, I don't, I don't emphasize that as much. You have the umbrella of protection, these like hardcore patriarchy teachings, hardcore inerrancy teachings, which, I mean, here as a historian, what I can say is there is a history here, right? These ideas are formed in a particular historical and theological moment, and then they are used to particular ends, and inerrancy in particular is very unevenly applied, <laughs> right? In SBC circles, very unevenly applied. So, you know, harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel through the eye of the needle. Oh, we can talk analogies and we can talk, you know, we can literally make up fake stories about, oh, you see, there was a gate in Jerusalem that was called the eye of the needle, and it was, camels could get through, but they just had to duck. Um, I'm not making this up. <laughs> Right? You've heard that one. See? See evidence here. Um, so that kind of theology, yes. I mean, we could go there, but um, what I did see in the book, oh, and also another thing I didn't talk much about, but I think I might in the next book, is the whole church growth movement. Hugely important here in, in, a, in a number of different ways. Um, and then, but really what I'm saying is, okay, theology is important, but maybe not exactly the way people are, well, certainly not exactly the way people are saying it, it is, but theology is not an independent variable, right? Theology is responding and it is morphing and it is being used again, unequally applied in different ways. And then what I'm also seeing is the theological distinctions that matter to men in seminaries who are, you know, fighting each other, that's their job, matter much, much less on the consumer end. Right? And that's, that's one of the points I'm trying to make. And so in the book, if you read, you know, I have like, oh, they disagree over secessionism, and they disagree over um, um, baptism. And the number of these, which in, in previous eras of uh, church history, people killed each other over, right? And now we're all cool, but are you complementarian? Okay, great, right, you know, or are you not? You're out of the gospel coalition. The gospel coalition. When I meet people in the gospel coalition, um, I like to ask them, you know, who was never welcome in your gospel coalition? Are you sure you have the right name for that? Right? Because, or is it just a kind of comp club, right? Complementarians only, welcome. And do you see what you did? by this gatekeeping, right, around the gospel, right? And so, so theology matters, yes, but not in the way that the theologians are saying it matters. It matters in all kinds of different ways. But then again, the consumer side, these distinctions matter so much less because the way this works is, uh, so you might go to John MacArthur's church, but you're tuning into televangelism and you're listening to Salem Radio and you're, you're pulling it all in and it's very much this, again, this, this culture that they might fight over this or that, 
but really how are the boundaries being drawn in terms of who is in and who is out, and it is not over um, whether you're pre-millennial or post-millennial. Yeah. Let me say one thing. Uh, since we started a little late, about 10 minutes late, we'll go to 440, so I just want to kind of let to the questioners answers. in particular. Yeah. No, that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, hi there. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm actually a history graduate student from UCCS. Awesome. And so I'd like to ask a, a history question, Please. if that's all right, because, I mean, throughout your entire talk, one of the things you've made it very clear is, you know, especially with that last quote, was knowledge of history is the thing that's really going to help us get out of that. But on the other hand, uh, the New Yorker recently put out an article called The End of the English Major about how pretty much yeah, every single right. college is down on its yeah. humanities. Uh, your alma mater, Notre Dame, is down 70% humanities uh, students from 2012 to 2022. Yeah. On the one hand, if history is the answer to that, like, that doesn't bode very well. It does not. It does not. No. Right. And, and, and uh, the, the quote that I closed with, right? Now think about what's happening right now in schools. What's happening with, uh, you know, push back to the 1619 project with the 1776 commission and what's happening with what is allowed to be taught in Florida schools. And again, like this is not CRT, this is basic US history. And if you cannot talk about race and racism in, in US history, um, it's not history, right? It's just not. So, <laughs> So this is a huge problem. And then it's, it's a worse, actually, in evangelical spaces. They're, they're very comfortable with this whitewashing of history. They have done it to their own histories. They have controlled their own narratives. I actually I wrote a piece in the New York Times on precisely this issue of how evangelicals have shaped their own history, which I kind of knew but only fully realized after my book came out. Because I mean, if you, as a history student, you read my book and you know who I'm citing. You can look at the footnotes, but you know already, oh, that's Darren Dochuk, that's Matt Sutton, that's right. Like, I, I, I'm using a whole bunch of peer-reviewed scholarship in this book. Any historian knows it, right? And if you look at the footnotes, uh, you see it. But um, uh, so, so it's, it's, it's all there. But evangelicals who read the book had uh, one almost universal response. This is the story of my life, and I had no idea. <laughs> How can it be both? Right? This is a story of my life, but I never understood how all these pieces fit together and were a part of this. And, and you know, Billy Graham, he was a, he was, he was a great guy. He was a, but no, I mean, yes, <laughs> he was an evangelist, soul-saving, and also all of this. And the Billy Graham that I describe in Jesus and John Wayne is the Billy Graham in every, like, peer-reviewed, you know, history, almost, except maybe the ones written by um, evangelicals themselves, many of which are not peer-reviewed, right? And so... <laughs> Uh, not all, but, but some. But even then, like, which stories make it in? Which don't you want to tell? I had that same instinct, remember? I put it aside. And I was like, is this what I should be doing as a Christian scholar? And then by 2016, I realized this is exactly what I need to be doing as a Christian scholar. And a lot of my pushback from evangelical uh, theologians, seminary folks, is on this issue. Um, you, you need to tell the nice side of evangelicalism. I'm like, you guys have already done that. I've got another thing to tell, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that was a great segue for my question. Uh, I work for the World Evangelical Alliance, so I have a sort of interest in this. Uh, it's a marvelous book and a marvelous presentation. And you have a thesis. But when you talk about Colorado Springs, you talk about new life and focus. You don't talk about Compassion International or First Presbyterian Church of Colorado Springs, neither of which fit your paradigm. Obviously, you can't cover everything. Obviously, you've pointed out here, there is another side of evangelicals who greatly appreciate what you've done. My question is this. Is it possible that you're thwarting your own prescriptive goals by disempowering the evangelicals who think more like you and giving the rest of the world license to write us all off as wackos? Fair question, and you and I have already corresponded, so you already know my answer a little bit. But uh, uh, so, yeah, Compassion International, not in this book, right? Um, and uh, I want to be very clear, this is not a history of evangelicalism. It is not a history of evangelicalism writ large. Right? If it would, it would look entirely different. It's a history of white evangelical masculinity and militarism as they are entwined, right? And so Compassion International does not take center stage in that narrative. 
Uh, and so uh, I, I shared a piece with you that I wrote on a kind of um, uh, the tension between this more aggressive militant strand and the kinder, gentler version of evangelicalism as I experienced it at a Donald Trump event that was hosted by Karen Pence. And it was, intro was all praise music and it looked like Joanna Gaines had decorated the whole stage. <laughs> And it was all this, you know, the, the kinder, gentler uh, evangelicalism that was then used to promote uh, Trump's candidacy so that he could protect this, right? That they can go hand in hand, and I use the gender analogy to show how the masculine protector can protect the more vulnerable, right? Now, uh, again, um, and then I would also point to a, a work like um, Melanie McAllister's. Uh, work on global evangelicalism, where she looks at the global outreach and she looks at these charities and she looks at that and doesn't condemn them all and looks at what they're doing, but say, look at the, in the 1990s and 2000s, the attention to the global persecution of, of Christians, right? Very important story. And then she also looks at how evan American evangelicals took those narratives of the persecution of Christians that were very legitimate in some places overseas and embrace them on their own behalf, and then use them to, again, justify this militancy as well. So all of which to say, it is very complicated. Many, many books could be written on evangelicalism, still need to. The question is not which one is right. The question is, how do these fit together? Right? How does one speak to the other? And that's what, um, yes, I had a thesis. It was, it was very tight, and my editor kept me to that. I wanted to include a chapter on alternative masculinities within evangelicalism. And he's like, no, say one thing. This is how this works. Right? I think it was a good choice, but there was so much more to be said. So much more to be said. Am I, am I kind of sabotaging because I'm making all evangelicals look bad? I don't know. There's, some, there's, there's good evangelicals in my book. There are amazingly good, that, that, it bugs me when you know, the, the critics are, um, you know, where is the love, where is the hate, you're really mean. Um, and, and historians are supposed to show empathy. You're not showing empathy to Doug Wilson. And like, do you know who I am showing empathy to? The people who have been trampled under these ideologies, right? Where, where is the empathy for the sex abuse survivor? You know what you've done to these folks, right? It's doubly traumatized. And you've pushed them out, and you've given standing ovations to the perpetrators, yeah. right? Yeah. How about one, maybe two, we'll see, but go ahead. Okay. I'll stick around, you guys. All right, that's a lot of pressure, but um, <laughs> thank you so much. And um, so I work in abortion rights advocacy here in Colorado, um, and we just passed three really exciting bills yesterday got signed into law. But um, I'm curious, I just always find it really shocking when uh, white evangelicals vote for candidates who have paid for a past sexual partner to have an abortion. And I think following the, the thread, what you said about um, white evangelicals voted for Trump not despite their values, but, but because of them. Um, and I'm just curious where you think that that fits into this, this bigger question. Okay, this is not a short answer question. <laughs> I don't know what to do here. Um, so, so thank you for that. I, um, uh, so I said economics, short shrifted. I could have done more on LGBTQ and on abortion. I, I give a little bit of attention, but mostly say, look at these issues in the context of the story I tell. But abortion especially is not reducible to that context. It is not. There is a much longer history of, you know, of anti-abortion in the, in, in the history of Christianity, right? And, and so I, I do push back against um, maybe progressive scholars who are like, oh, it's all a cover for racism. It's all, it's, it's not, which doesn't mean it isn't also that, right? I wouldn't say cover, but, right, it, it's all very complicated. Um, your question is, is not one that... Um, I mean, you've got the hypocrisy, you've got the ends justify the means, you've got the, you know, uh, if, if they, they can bring up this legislation, then it's all good. I honestly, in the end, I feel like when I was writing this book and on some of these issues, I feel like at a certain point as a historian, I, I reached my limits and I passed the baton to the psychologist. 
um, and to social psychologists as well, because there is a real um, disconnect, but there's a sense of, okay, well, there's one fallen man, but he's, he's confessed, he's forgiven, grace comes very quickly and very cheaply to men with power, and, um, and not so much to others. Right, and so this idea of, um, but the right policies, the right laws, the right coercion will more than make up for it. And if it's this us versus them mentality and we decide he is one of us, then that's really what matters. Um, but on the issue of abortion, there was just so much more to say. I actually did um, give a talk on this issue uh, at Harvard a few weeks ago, and that's available online if you want to see um, kind of some of the broader and then more specific framing that I bring to that issue. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Patrick. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So I just want to say that I really enjoyed your book, and it was very enlightening. Um, I was a little bit uh, surprised that you didn't mention or explicitly address the rise of conspiracy theories, especially QAnon. Uh, it seems as though evangelicals are immersed in this to, to an yeah. in, inordinate degree, right? So do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, part of it is the date of, of publication, right? This book was published in 2020. It was finished in 2019, a full year before it was released. So that mean it, it means it was in production out of my hands during the impeachment, right? And it was just in final edits really when, when QAnon started. At the time I was finishing the book, it was like, is this a theme? We didn't have a lot of survey data out. We didn't, I mean, we, I had a sense, but so uh, I didn't mean to exclude it. It's just, hist it was very challenging for me um, as a historian who up until now has only written about people who are dead long <laughs> since <laughs> to have like them keep doing things. <laughs> while the work is out of my hands. <laughs> but um, all of which is to say, yes, yeah, so here's the connections with, with QAnon, because I've done a number of interviews, and I don't even know if I've written on this or just done a lot of interviews. But you have this us versus them. You have this long history of not trusting outsiders, not trusting science. Uh, we, could, we could bring up presuppositionalism here, uh, the idea that all truth is God's truth, but only those who are in, you know, kind of God's circle have access to that truth. So all the outsiders, the secularists, <laughs> did you somebody laugh at that? Like, this is super common teaching in these spaces, um, right? So if you don't have access to God's truth, why would you want to empower um, people who don't have access to God's truth? Why would you want to this is talking about voter suppression. This is talking about all kinds of things, right? And, but that center of who has God's truth is drawn pretty tightly, right? The church down the street, oh no, false teaching, right? Um, so, so it's conspiratorial. Uh, it's just kind of built for that. Also, I think we could get into kind of prophecy uh, circles. And honestly, I would, I would like to think about how evangelicals do Bible studies, too, uh, you know, in terms of let's open the scriptures and find God's message to me in it. Uh, it's not the same thing, but there are all of these practices, uh, individual and communal practices, I think make evangelicals, I know make evangelicals more susceptible to QAnon and, con and to conspiratorial thinking. And then not trusting the mainstream media, not trusting experts, not trusting anybody who isn't saying exactly what we're saying. Um, it's just a recipe for um, just these, in, in the whole media, um, you know, echo chamber, all of it comes together, all of it's relevant. All right, thank you. Let's give you a Thank you. All right, and thank you all as well for coming. This is a wonderful turnout. I hope this bodes well for future events, but thank you. And do not forget there's a meet and greet and book signing right outside this door. So no stampeding, but um, hopefully we'll see you out in the foyer. Thank you again. Appreciate thank you.